So what are we talking about today? I think it's a tried and true topic, isn't it? I think so. Uh, you, you know, you've got some experience or something with this other database. I'm, I'm, I'm I, curious. Yeah, a little bit. You're right. Uh, yeah, so um, we're going to talk about Oracle and how you can go from Oracle to Cassandra. I This is probably number one topic a lot of places I go. I don't know about you, but it's just a lot of Oracle out there, right? It's been around for 30 years now something like that, and it's an established database. People are comfortable with it. They, they seem to use it a lot. I think you even used it, if I if memory serves. <laughs> For 15 years, yes, uh, pretty actively. I made a lot of money doing it, I'm pretty happy to say, and I, I can't say anything bad about it. I mean, from a, from a usability standpoint, um, it gets pretty complex. But um, for the workload that I had given it, it was it was a solid choice. Um, there's, you know, there was a lot of choices out there. But you know, let's why don't we just jump into why we make these choices? How about that? <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> so uh, here here's the problem, people. We like to collect data, and I think I say this a lot, Rachel. We're we're like data hoarders, right? As people. <laughs> Talking about you and me, so, you, no, know, you and no. I do like to collect data. But. We love our data. Yeah, <laughs> look at my phone; it's full of it. I have to keep buying a bigger one. But the uh, the data problem that we collect, we love to collect data, goes back to ancient Egypt. And um, you know, this is <laughs> I know this is kind of setting the wayback machine. This is way before any databases, but we collected data. We collected data about crop yields, and we uh, collected data about financial transactions. This is a ledger. This is probably one of your first real databases. There it is right there opened up and looking at you. What, what is that, period. like an ancient Egyptian ledger? No, no. <laughs> I believe this is from the 1800s, I think, somewhere in there. Uh, or, yeah, somewhere in there. Anyway, um, it's just, hey, I gave you money, I took money, and here's the balance. And this is how you made sure that things got done right. And if you had two books, then you were going to get in trouble. Oh, but, flashbacks to accounting class. Oh. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty bad. And, of course, we collected things into tables. Train tables have been around for as long as trains, probably. And that was the tabular format, the columns and rows. That's uh, interesting how we came upon that beforehand. But collecting data has always been a problem with the humans. We, we, do, we are collectors. And we really started hitting this first data plateau. Now, Rachel, I'm going to go through these data plateaus um, as, a, as a concept. But the plateau that I'm talking about is we started to limit ourselves out. Now, <clears throat> do you know where this is? Do you know what this is? It looks busy. It is busy. This is the reservation office in Little Rock, Arkansas for American Airlines. Now, oh, that was my next guess. Cool. Yeah, I, I know. It's like, wow, it just right on the tip of your tongue. And this was, a, it was an interesting place because this is the only place you could get a reservation for an airline in the 1950s. Now, in the 1950s in the United States, there was a lot of extra income. People started flying a lot. And they were taking thousands and thousands of phone calls. Do you see, like, in the foreground, there was a guy here with a little box that the lid flipped up? Well, that is how they marked out who was sitting in the plane. They put a little paper clip next to the, the piece of paper with the seat assignment. And when you called in, they clipped the seat and say, okay, that seat's taken. As you can imagine, there's some scaling problems with this. Now I understand why we use the call and confirm our seats on plane way back. Mm, right. As you can imagine. Cool sense. Yeah, th this would not be the most efficient way of doing it. And so American Airlines was stuck. They had a huge problem. And luckily, there was a company out there that had solutions. So the first data solution, which is really using a computer, is... The system called Saber, right? And Saber was a system built by IBM. It is still here today, folks. You can, when you book an airline, you probably are going through Saber. And uh, it was amazing because what they were allowed to do from the airport or from a central call office was collect information from people who wanted a flight. And people got on the plane and they had a seat. And it was all very organized and centralized. And really, that was the first solution. And it was awesome. And it started this whole industry. Um, so let's pay a second for homage. Okay, I'm done. Um, so, but what happened? Who did you call if you wanted a database, Rachel? Bum, 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 bum. IBM. IBM. Big Blue. I've worked there. <laughs> yeah, and probably many people on the phone have too. 
So IBM was the one who made the big database, and if you needed a database, you called Dave Blue. Now there were competitors, but let's face it, IBM, that was the old adage. No one ever got fired by an IBM. And so that was the 1970s, 1960s. For 20 years, they dominated the database industry, probably even 30 years. But um, things do change. We hit this data plateau again. Uh, here we are. This is actually a picture from 1977, I believe. And IT workers of the world unite. You didn't, they had to wear a white shirt with a black tie. That was like the rule. And your room size computer is ready. And the plateau was not everyone could afford a room size computer. And that's okay. That's, that's really interesting. So we have a new solution. Now we have this microcomputer revolution that's kicking up. And here comes all these new players, right? Um, the one though that stands out above the rest is Oracle, and they built a relational database that works on a variety of systems and more or less supplanted what IBM was doing pretty easily because it fit. Um, I, this is where I come along. I started using Oracle in the 1990s because I needed a working database that was relational because I learned that in university. So it, it dominated from the 80s, well, I couldn't say 80s, 90s when it really started dominating. And <clears throat> I don't know how, how, how far back you go, Rachel, but I'm sure you were along here somewhere. <laughs> yeah, somewhere around there. And of course, this happened, right? The world got all internet-y. And well, it's pet.com, but anyway, um, it, this happened. I mean, the internet became a thing and the whole world became data connected. And when you look at the scaling problems that they could bring, it dwarfed anything you could pull uh, on a microcomputer. But here, but we have this problem, right? This is, I mean, what, what was your impression of the internet at certain times? <laughs> <laughs> well, besides after the brrr, boo, yeah. to, to hook up, we, uh, we sat and waited a lot. <laughs> Is, is it down yet? Is it downloaded yet? I mean, I remember like going off and, you know, doing so many other things, waiting for stuff to download. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so we have uh, we have this problem, right? Which is um, we put too many people on there, and we get this website is slow problem. And it wasn't just because it was a dial-up modem. It was because we were building bigger and bigger databases, but the database was a problem, and this is one I, I dealt with a lot in the late 90s when I worked at dot-coms and did a lot of consulting and was trying to make money and be an Oracle consultant, is my first answer was buy a bigger machine. And was, I love this one. This is an Enterprise 4500, I think, or 450. Love that. Had wheels, portable, awesome. But, you know, that, that was the thing you did. You got money from VCs and you bought a bigger machine. Awesome. Um, to 2005, that... It really, I put that in my mind as a moment in that we had this problem, the thundering herds. And it was just because everybody and their brother was getting on the internet and um, you never knew when things were gonna come. I worked in education. The thing that we had to deal with was the last minute deadlines. And of course, everybody showed up at the last second, right? And what happens when we have thundering herds? This problem, ugh, right? And this is getting pretty close to where we are now. Now, this is, this is a big moment. Everyone knows where you were when this happened, right? You remember where you were, Rachel? Uh, yes. Yeah. And who was it that got up on stage and said, you're going to buy a million or a billion or a trillion of these things? I totally said no at the time, too, as I you know, speak into my MacBook Air with my iPad yeah. Plus, right? I know, right. I, I, I said no, too. I'm like, oh, that'll be, a, that'll be no, uh, just another iPod. No, it's, it's now dominating my life and I, mean, I do have a zoom though so I'm not a very good harbinger of technology no you shouldn't be on this webinar at all <laughs> but you come around right you come around okay. <laughs> you, 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 yeah exactly so this iPhone thing well now it's every every bit of phonage out there has a screen that looks somewhat like that with an app on it has probably a computer um, listening to it somewhere and Without a doubt, zero chance you will not have a database involved. And that has created a problem because now everyone expects it to be online all the time. And 
you could have the next cool app that just takes off. And that thundering herd is going to stampede you and you're a competitor. So let's face it, you go on the iPhone app store or you go on Google Play and you look for an app, you could find three or four competitors instantly. And that means to be relevant, you have to have something that works. So slow is as good as dead, right? So here we are. Welcome, everyone. Gather around to the third data plateau. We've hit it. <laughs> so this is what we did, right? This is, it was like, uh, we always use Oracle. I always used Oracle. Did you always use Oracle? <laughs> Yeah, he's Oracle. Uh, maybe, maybe a little bit of MySQL here and there, but uh, sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. SQL Server, sure. SQL Server is out there too. Yeah, I had a bad, bad bit of that in my life and uh, some Postgres, um, Informix when I was going to go old school. But <clears throat> the yeah, the the choice of that that particular time was okay. You want to be safe, go with Oracle, and. Everything that connected to the internet that needed to talk to something, and look at all these applications. We have mobile application, we have web applications, we have gaming and telemetry, stock markets. And none of these really fit well anymore because of the problem that's inside that. You know, it's a single server relational database. Now we can build it out and do more with it, but is that really the case? Well, no, it was designed to solve problems of 30 years ago. It wasn't designed to solve the problems of now. And, and you know, Larry Ellison's a cool dude, but he couldn't see the future. He didn't know what was going on. But that, wait a minute, hold on. Isn't an oracle someone who can see the future? Oh, we'll just leave that alone. <laughs> <laughs> just, I'm just kidding. All right, all right, no, no. But that was actually a cool name. Uh, I have to give him that. That is a cool name. But isn't but, Cassand wasn't Cassandra able to see the future? Okay, never mind. We'll get nobody there. believed her. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so let's look at this potential. Um, I will propose to you, the listening audience, a third database solution, and that is Apache Cassandra. And it is born and bred around this new problem set. It was built to tackle this issue that we created for ourselves, which is, hey, let's just put a billion people on a particular application and make them happy. What year was uh Cassandra started? Uh, it was uh, 2008. So that's after the big old, hey, we got mobile apps mm -hmm. thing, right? Like they went, oh, maybe this isn't going to work. Maybe we need a better solution. But, it, you know, the thing is, though, it was not – Cassandra came out in 2008. I mean, that was, that was when it was conceived. But there was a lot of thinking before then. Um, it goes back to uh, the Dynamo paper, which was 2007. The Google Big Table paper, which is 2006, and those things had a life inside of their Amazon and Google before then, too. So these problems were being solved in, with computer science earlier at those companies that I highlighted earlier. So Google, Amazon, they were, here they are looking down the barrel of the gun of a billion users, and they're solving those problems quickly with computer science. And just like a centrifuge, those things are spinning out and flying out and finding themselves into projects and open source. So, Rather than trying to put together a sharded MySQL system with bubble gum and toothpicks. That seems really stable. <laughs> Not. Well, all right. So I'm I'm glad you mentioned that. So let's let's talk about what if we bring in the Oracle architecture. So I'm going to talk about this from uh, from a practitioner standpoint. So um, I built a lot of these systems in my day. So if you will indulge me, Rachel. <laughs> I always do. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Because what, what I want to show you is, is how, I would, how I built these systems, or at least there was some of the technology that you could bring to bear to scale up and make it work, right? So and these should be familiar. So here's my single Oracle instance. Great. Um, running, you know, whatever, 10G, 11I, 11H, QRZ, whatever. And so we, we have an Oracle instance running on a single server. When I get to the point where I need to scale, I go up, right? So the next step is going to be more CPU, and that, that's always an easy one. Um, I can call my server vendor, Dell, HP, whoever, and I can say, I need a bigger box. Awesome. And when I'm with more CPU, I'm going to need more memory. And if I'm running more CPU and more memory, and I'm running a lot, I probably will want to use the database resource manager, DBRM, and uh, my 
if you have a choice of not using DBRM, I'd go with that. I've never been able to make it work exactly the way I wanted to, but that's an option. And you have to manage, you know, if you have 32 CPUs in a box, you have to manage that. Okay, so now I have all the CPU memory. I'm going to add more disk, which probably means that I'm going to run out of slots on the server, so I'm going to put in a SAN. Awesome. But if I'm running a SAN, probably going to use ASM because I want to manage that storage properly. And uh, managing storage on an Oracle server is really a dark art and um, a good way to make money, too. So this is going to solve my scaling problem in a single server. Great. And if I need to do more application scaling, which is always going to be the case, um, I can add in times 10. Um, times 10, of course, is a in-memory uh, database that works pretty well with um, the Oracle RDBMS at the back end. Is that, like so, your only, is that your only choice for, for caching? Uh, for caching, well, you can, Coherence is another product that Oracle sells, but it is not integrated as much, and it is a key value store. Um, some people use Coherence. It's more of a replacement for Memcached. Um, mm. Times 10 is more integrated, so that's going to give you the scale you want. Um, and uh, let's face it, when you start getting into real scale problems, you're going to need to add more servers. That's the, you know, more, more of that. And so you, there's only a certain size you can get. Um, I think I told you the story about um, I used to buy six and eight U servers, and those are ridiculous. Um, but you said you needed a forklift or something. <laughs> well, it was <laughs> they they look like forklifts. They're in these data centers. There's these little lifter things because there's humans can't lift these things up and not lose a finger. So you have to put this little forklift thing underneath this huge server and lift it up into the rack, and it's a huge operation. Um, and it's at that point you're kind of laughing to yourself. Maybe that room size computer wasn't a bad idea because at least it was in a room. <laughs> so um, what was the other way to do this was adding more servers instead of the bigger server because you run out of space, which means you're probably going to use a SAN. Actually, you will use a SAN. And if you're using a SAN in multiple servers with Oracle, you're going to be in RAC territory. That's real application clusters. And this is um, – this is about the the most viable way of running ser several servers. Now you can do a sharded architecture as well, but rack is how you get more fluid um, failover or things like that. But to use rack, you're gonna have to use clusterware, um, fast application notification in case things go bad, and definitely cache fusion so that your your data is up to date and working well and fast and everything else. Pretty complex. I can tell you right now, I've never seen a rack system work flawlessly or perfectly out of the box. I've always had interesting failover issues, but I think that um, it is definitely a way to scale. Interesting thing, but, though. But they're really cheap, too, right? Like, you know, <laughs> and, uh, anybody can go out and buy one. Yeah, well, anybody can buy one if you have a huge budget. And that is probably it, it, the, the budgeting constraints are you have to pay per license and you get a sand out of the deal, and that's going to cost you a lot of money. Plus, you can, well, the, the thing that makes it, it keeps it affordable is you can only go up to 100 nodes of the rack. After that, forget about it. Um, so, wait, 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 wait. What happens if you need more than 100 nodes? Anyway, Golden Gate. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> there, there is no bigger. Um, I smell could, a plateau. Yeah, plateau would, coming. Yeah, that would be one. Um, so uh, Golden Gate, uh, another, another cool integrated product that you can use for active-active, somewhat active-active transactions across multiple data centers. Um, it has lots of neat modes where you can have it fan out, fan in. Um, use Golden Gate, guess what you lose? Acid transactions. So you're saying that if you, if you go to the Golden Gate, you drop acid? What? Like. Uh, yeah, it might actually help. Um, it would make the docs a little more interesting if you dropped acid. But you don't get acid transactions. Um, and that's, that's a bummer because a lot of people love those and they're gone. Um, don't do that. So the, the little step down from that is using Data Guard. Data Guard is a way to manage the transaction or manage the, your secondary databases so you can have failover, which is nice in those cases, but it is a failover. There is a mean time between failure. And you can go with Active or Standby. Active costs more money, which means you have to pay for reading that data. Now, all of this data now is protected and scaling and everything up to a certain point. What if you want to analyze it? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's right. We're going to do some ETL. So, okay. yeah. Well, like, but Hadoop isn't fast. Like, what about other places? Like, what about Nativa or Vertica or anything like that? Well, that was your previous employer. You tell me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe yeah. stuff up. 
<laughs> yeah, no, you're good at that. Um, you, you're sure you could use uh, uh, any of the, the other data warehousing technologies, but you're going to be doing ETL. There's nothing in place. Uh, so, okay. Like, what happens about, like, inline, like, line of business? Like, you've got all your data in that database. Shouldn't you just be doing analysis there? I mean, I hate it. So, you know, just to be completely upfront, like, I've spent years of my life writing ETL jobs, move data from source systems to uh, data marts and data warehouses. And right. It's right. A and it could be a pain. Right. And, I mean, I, I'm not on a slide. I mean, on a slide here. I, I can't, I can't add any more to this particular slide. Now, I, there's pro probably another way, and I bet you're going to tell me all about it too. But um, if you look, at, if you look at this slide, I mean, this is—I don't think this is an unreasonable thing. Now, granted, you wouldn't use DataGuard and Golden Gate, or you might actually have used both for different scenarios. But um, or you may not use Golden Gate with Rack, for instance. Maybe you will. Um, and then, of course, the, the final solution is using Exadata, which kind of wraps it all up into a big box, and it's literally a forklift. I mean, you have to have a forklift that's that big to bring it in, um, but it, 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 Exadata. But this is complex, right? This is a lot of stuff going on right now, and um, I and it could I, be more complex, couldn't it, or less? Oh yeah, right. I mean, no, there's no. lots of different options. That's part of the problem. This is why my bill rate was three seventy five an hour for Oracle Consulting because it was complex. I mean, how do complex things fail? Complex ways. <laughs> So I could come back and build more. I'm hours. sure complex things fail in simple ways too, like you know somebody knocking, you know, letting loose a toddler in a, um, in yeah, a chicken in a inside center. of a data center, right? <laughs> chicken in a data center. Yeah, and well, then that's just more bill hours for me. So why don't we simplify? Let's we simplify a little. Hey, actually, go back to slide. I want to I want to point out something that's in your. Uh, so notice that. Uh, Patrick put some nice little boxes around stuff and put some words like uptime and scale and stuff like that. You know, we were trying to group stuff together to, to give you an idea of like why you're going to be doing certain things. Because, okay, you can go ahead and next slide. Next slide. We can simplify everything back down to um, you know, a single server again. And now we're going to talk about a single server of Cassandra. Um, so the whole point of this webinar is to introduce people who are familiar with Oracle to the concepts behind Cassandra. So what is similar to Cassandra? What's different? Uh, so starting with a single server. So Cassandra was designed from the get-go to be distributed. So you can run Cassandra on a single server. We all have, uh, you know, most of us engineers here at DataFacts have been having running on our, our laptops. I have it running on my little MacBook Air. Um, but it is designed, first and foremost, to be distributed. And it's de designed to be distributed for two reasons. For, Patrick? Well, no, I, for one thing, um, because that's the only way you're going to have any guarantees of uptime. Yeah. Single any server will fail. And any guarantees of scale. So just yeah, it's good. It's, that single server is going to fail. I, I've had, there's absolutely zero chance that you're going to have a single server last forever. And how, but then how big does a single server have to be? Are we talking about the more CPU, the more, you know, DL380s or super domes or whatever, exadata boxes? No, we're talking about commodity hardware because we need, Cassandra was built to be scaled out to provide continuous uptime and, and scale, but by using um, hardware that wasn't going to break the bank. Or by using cloud, uh, you know, AWS or Google Computer or Azure, all that stuff will, uh, will work great. So one of these commodity hardware. Yeah. Are you saying I'll never have to use that forklift again? <laughs> I'll no. never say never. <laughs> because you know, the one thing about Cassandra, it can actually scale for more than 100 nodes. So. Oh, that's awesome. Okay, let's let's do that then. So, what do I need to do? <laughs> okay. So, all right. Off my uh, off my path here, dude. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so one of those nodes is you know minimum of about eight CPU, thirty two gigs of RAM, about a terabyte of spinning disk, maybe you know up to five terabytes of SSD. So we're not talking about massive machines. Of course you can put more, but for the most part that's a pretty typical uh, Cassandra node. So um, 
As we talked about, Cassandra is designed from the get-go to be distributed. So here is your, now your database is distributed around a ring. And all those nodes in there are peers. So there's no master node, there's no slave node, there's no single point of? Patrick? Failure! Yay! Yeah, no single point of failure. Um, so like let's go to the next slide. So let's talk about how data is distributed a bit. Uh, there's actually the ability to uh, put a range of data on each node of 2 to the 127th. And that's a really, really big number. And that, those numbers are too big for my slide, so I'm actually just going to simplify it down to tens in this case. But, you know, realize that you can put more than 80 uh, primary keys inside your database with Cassandra. You're cool there. That's how we can get more than 100 servers. Just kidding. Um, all right, so each node um, is responsible for um, a certain range or ranges of data. So next slide. And if you want to add more nodes to this cluster, so if you need to add capacity, you need to add, you need to scale, you don't have to just scale your individual servers, though you can. You can also just easily add more servers to your ring. So in this case, we've added two new nodes. Next. And those nodes are going to get pieces of data from the other nodes. Next. And the um, cluster will automatically reconfigure itself in order to, instead of each node being in charge of um, 10 tokens, it's going to be in charge of 8 tokens. And all those nodes are going to contribute data to the new ones to bring it online. So um, now, um, uh, sorry, I'm going to break the flow in here, but, you know, that's what I do. Um, the uh, rack, uh, when I showed the rack slide, that's a shared everything configuration. Now, that, that, how is that different from what I'm seeing here? <laughs> oh, one of our favorite topics, SAN. So no, no, so this is a shared nothing architecture. It's exactly the opposite. Like putting a SAN behind a Cassandra um, cluster is like the single best way of failure. Um, I mean, that, that's a webinar all on its own. And if you're interested in, in more detail there, please, no, please don't hesitate to Hit me or Patrick up on, on Twitter or ask any of your um, local data stacks uh, engineers. But for the most part, it, it, it's kind of that when I do go to see clients, which I do a lot, and you go talk to these big organizations and you tell them the type of hardware they need and everybody gets excited and they go talk to procurement and procurement's like, no, we have to buy SANS because SANS are best for databases. And, and then you hit your head on the, on the, on the table for a while and you try to explain IOPS, and you explain physics, and but they're like, we're sorry, this is all that we can buy. So if you're in that situation, don't despair. We can help you. Uh, there, there is a way out of the SAN nightmare. Yeah, well, the SAN, SAN nightmare is, I mean, it just adds complexity and cost, um, but shared nothing is really, it is the best way to do distributed because it makes it easier in the long run. Yeah, well, you won't be afraid to. Well, you, you've just you just purchased or you've just put together this database that is designed for no single point of failure, and then you put a SAM behind it, which creates a single point of failure. Hey, if you don't have a single point of uh, failure, we will provide you with one. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, also, just uh, in mind that uh, Cassandra is designed to be always on, never yeah. down. So as you add new nodes to the system, the streaming of, of data from the other nodes is actually a background process. Everything is a background process in Cassandra because it's designed to never, ever, ever have to be brought down. So you add new nodes to the system, you upgrade your, your system, all those never going to bring your system down. But what happens if one of those nodes fails? So say node 80 at the top there decides to conk out on me. Um, I, it would be really good if I had copies of that data someplace that's not on backup. I advanced your slide a little early, sorry, but anyway. <laughs> it's cool. It's, it's, it's all right. You can manage that. Okay, good, because you're a professional. <laughs> and and you're a professional slide advancer. I am not a professional slide advancer. Okay, anyway. <laughs> They're going to come up with a better solution to this besides passing balls around. Yeah, hey, WebEx people, I know you're on the line. Fix this. Okay, anyway. <laughs> yeah, they're a client. Um, uh, okay, so the application comes down, um, the application will uh, is going to write to the Cassandra ring. Now, as I mentioned earlier, all these nodes are peers, so each, any one of these nodes can act as the coordinator. 
It doesn't have to be just the one at the top. Uh, there's a driver that sits um, on the application that has a number of different policies that says how do you round robin or retry any of those particular um, nodes. So we're just using an example of, of one here, but keep in mind that any of these nodes can and will be the coordinator. So the application uh, writes a, um, a row of data. The primary key of that data, the partition key, is hashed and it's assigned a token value. So go ahead and go to the next slide. That token value um, is actually can be written in, in any number of places. And you, as a database administrator, decide how many copies of that data do you want around the ring. The most common number is three. Uh, mostly that way, if one of your nodes goes down, you can fix the other, whatever was wrong with the first one on a second one and still be able to have a third one available, a third copy available to retrieve requests. So I like three. Um, it's also, you know, there's also a Monty Python joke somewhere in there, but three is a good number. Yes, it is. <laughs> I mean, and so I think to really, because it's been proven time and time again, and there's some math behind this, that a replication factor of three is um, is a good trade-off for space because you're going to be these are going to be replicated three times, and they're also it's for the, the uptime. Um, another thing is how you can how you know, your data is consistent at quorum because then you have three nodes, you're going to have 51 percent. That means two nodes online. So that's, that's some of the reasoning behind it. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so now that as the data was distributed uh, to three nodes, we can lose two of the nodes and still maintain uptime. But what happens if our data center goes down? And data centers do go down. There are chicken and toddlers being let loose every day in all data centers. It's a scourge on society. Uh, or there's natural disasters or, you know, actually real reasons that a data center might go down. Well, regions go down in AWS. I mean, this, this happens. Um, even even Amazon, I mean, I've, I've had that happen to me personally, um, and it's it's a reality, right? It's going to happen. And, and there's also times like uh, what happened last November that Amazon decided to reboot a random 10% of the nodes in AWS. Right. And nobody and, knew which nodes were going to be. It's just they were just going to pop out of existence. So what did everybody do? Oh, okay, everybody, don't. You might or might not have downtime. No, you can't, you can't set up your app like that. That's not how. That's not good for PR. <laughs> no, no, no. And then, you know, that was, um, so Netflix is, is a, a great user. They talk a lot about these two concepts. Um, they, they run Active Active, of course, because they want to, they're an Amazon 100%, but they know that there's going to be downtime. So they run Active Active. Um, they have a great webinar or a discussion on that you can go look up. But they also talk a lot about the individual notes, right? Because when the AWS reboot happened, thank you, Amazon. They didn't have any downtime because they were they were configured correctly and they had a good con uh, replication factor, good consistency level, and as nodes were blinking out, I think they lost like 300 nodes out of that out of that reboot process. They, they didn't have a second of downtime because they were ready, and this, the the database was built to withstand that. And That's you know, really the key. Netflix goes down. It's not just bad PR. It's like yeah. national news. I mean, the president gets involved, and yeah, it's pretty bad. My um. And my five-year-old has a fit to avoid that. Totally, exactly. It's not a good scene. But that, I mean, I think that's why they, and, and so data, uh, Netflix is a good example of those who hit that next data plateau, right, is they, they knew they couldn't get where they needed to go. They, they are increasing stock value for their, for their um, shareholders, and they're also making their users happier by keeping things online. They're like the cable company now. They have to be in mind all the time. They're better than the cable companies. <laughs> well, all right. cable companies need to be better than the cable companies nowadays. That's true. <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, so do you th so Cassandra already knows how to replicate data. So instead of just sending three uh, three pieces of data out among a single data center, we'll also send a, another one out to all the other data centers. So I have two data centers on this slide, but just can scale to as many as you want. Um, and we'll just send out uh, one copy over there. It picks a coordinator um, in the other data center, and then the coordinator, ooh, good advancing, thank you, Patrick, will thank you. distribute the data um, properly around that data center. Now, only because these are slides and I want things to look pretty, do we have the same number of nodes in the both data center and the same replication factor? Um, that's because symmetry looks nice. 
but symmetry isn't real life. So these data centers actually do not need to be symmetrical. They do not need to have the same number of nodes nor the same replication factor. They also don't need to be um, in the same place. They don't need to be in actual physical data centers. They could be one that could be in the cloud, one could be in uh, on premise, one could be in Azure. Like there, this is a this is a completely um, heterogeneous environment that you can. No, that's no, a typical and it's a typical arrangement. Um, it could be you know I've I've seen plenty of on prem that has another data center in a cloud environment because. Um, they don't. They ran out of room, and uh, so this this will enable that for sure. And we had um, Uyala was uh, had a discussion about how they move from on prem to the cloud and then back to on prem without any downtime based on this replication strategy. So there's some really interesting things you can do with this. And you know Hollywood hasn't caught up. I just watched Terminator, and the entire idea was that Skynet was in a single data center. Yeah. I, just, I, I spent the whole end of the movie like, but but. but we well, see. yeah, there's technology that solves that, but I guess that's not a very good example. Not at all. <laughs> Bad. So, anyway, so we've talked about uh, uh, uptime and scale. That is the, uh, yeah, Cassandra, again, was designed to be always available, always on multiple data centers, uh, various copies of the data within the data center. But we also talked about caching. So this thing also does have to be fast because we talked about down is down, but slow is also down. So remember those thundering mm -hmm. herds back in the uh, the 90s of you know your website being slow? That's not going to cut it anymore either. If you're on an app and you're and, and you can't get to where you want, it's so easy to uh -huh. go to a different app. There you can you can probably download another app in the time. So. Speed is, is very, very important as well, but if you put a caching layer, again, you are introducing more complexity, you're introducing another single point of failure, and that's not what we're looking for. So Cassandra right. is designed to do incredibly fast um, uh, transaction read and write. And how does this work? So first off, we have the application. It talks to the coordinator node. We saw that earlier. And it sends out a write request. That write request is going to hit um, a commit log that lives on disk. Uh, this uh, commit log provides durability um, and will also um, is append only and is written sequentially. So you've got one disk that sits there and writes sequentially and always appends and then when it fills up the file, it starts another one. Very, very simple. As soon as it hits that commit log, it acknowledges back to the coordinator and the write is good. At the same time, it's going to, well, asynchronously, it's going to write also to, the, uh, to memory. It's going to write to what's called a mem table. So once the data is in the mem table, it is now queryable. Um, and any, um, anybody coming from another, um, another node or another application process can read the data out of memory. Um, there's only so much memory. Uh, so eventually, those mem tables flush to disk into something that's called sorted strings tables. <clears throat> Oh, sorry. There we go. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> uh, those SS tables are also immutable, and they uh, the data in there is sorted and rented sequentially. Uh, the mem table, the mem memory is cleared, and the um, and the data lives is lives on disk. Those disks can be SSDs. They can be spinning uh, spinning disks. Dis Cassandra was actually designed to um, provide uh, fast read and write on spinning disk, but it also works very, very well on SSDs, of course. Eventually, those SS tables are merged together in a process called compaction, and compaction, uh, keeping up with compaction keeps your uh, read from being um, too um, spread out and speeds that, up, speeds that function up. Yeah, so I, I really feel like this is a critical thing. This is not an in-memory database, and even though it does go in a mem table, I hear people ask, is this an in-memory database? No because it writes a commit log, that is, an, that is a durable write. And so it is on disk, and then um, once it's in an SS table, it no longer needs to be in the commit log. So we're still using disk 100% across the board. So disk matters. Um, you, you don't get away with um, magic if you're using 7200 RPM SATA. The seek time on those is going to be the problem, right? So uh, just keep in mind, this is still a disk database. Right. And, and, and but disks only spin so fast, right? They only spin so fast, right? Physics, okay. Right. Oh, what's this? This looks yeah. scary. So this 
So um, back in the day when I was a DBA, this is uh, this is from OTN, good old OTN. This was the duties of admin, uh, database administrators, and so <clears throat> what I mean, these are. This is a reasonable list of things that you should know to be a decent database administrator. If you do and any this kind is of current, this is this was pulled off yesterday. This wasn't back in the day. This is right. No, now. this isn't back in the day. This is yesterday. We yanked this, and I, but I think it's just as relevant. Um, I mean, it's it's things to do with creating data. Um, how do you you know user security, safe, keeping your data safe, that kind of thing. I mean, these are all basic deals. There's, there's nothing complicated in here. It's not like how to set up a rack cluster or anything like that. It is really, um, and you could almost put this on any database, MySQL, anything. But what I think would be interesting, Rachel, is if we talk about how things, all right, so if I'm coming from this world, how do things translate into the world of Cassandra? Question. Luckily, luckily, we have we have tools for this. We have tools to make things easier for people who are Oracle or MySQL or SQL Server DBAs to get used to how things work in Cassandra. So, what's currently being highlighted here uh, in pink or red or whatever um, color shows up on your screen um, are uh, tasks that are handled by Ops Center. Um, Ops Center is uh, available um, for download, and you can use it against uh, Apache Cassandra or DataStacks Enterprise. So here's like a, um, a best practice services, which will actually go through your system and give you some ideas uh, on whether or not your replication is, is set up correctly, or your performance is good, or your um, security is set up right, or your backup. Uh, so the next one, we've got, this will take a look at your, um, at your ring. Right now we have a Cassandra uh, cluster with also solar or search and analytics. And we're seeing what is green, what is red, and what is yellow. So all those tell you the health of your individual nodes. And then we also just have the basic dashboard view, your cluster health, your utilization, your load. I mean, pretty much this is completely customizable. We'll give you all the stats. Of your of your system, just like you're used to with Enterprise Manager. So if I'm coming from the world of Oracle and I use Enterprise Manager, this is a, I think this is a pretty um, similar tool where it gives me an all-in-one look um, and lets me monitor things. Now I I say this a lot. You put a thousand nodes in a cluster, you better have something that can watch those. Um, this is not something you want to spin on your own. Now people do, but you don't have to. Op Center can manage a lot of this for you, and it helps you with a lot of things like updating the servers in a re in a regular fashion without having any downtime. It's pretty cool. Um, doing a massive upgrade of your database without any downtime is a bit of a trick, but not so much with this. You also can spin up new clusters with just a couple clicks in um, AWS or Azure. Yes, that's true. That's actually really cool. I use that quite a bit myself. Um, Oh, that's nice. Just like click, click, click. I want a five node cluster. Need to do some testing. It's just done for you. Absolutely. Um, so this is a little a doc slide just to show you. Hey, yep, there's documentation just like OTN, um, all available on on datastacks.com. Um, but uh, also that all backups can be managed through Ops Center or the command line, whichever one you prefer. Uh, something that people talk a lot about with Cassandra, like, well, if you have all this replication, do you need to back up? And of course you do, because it, I mean, your, your data's not going to go away, but there might be a mistake in your application. I, I, I know no developer has ever put a bug in an app that might have written incorrect data, but just in case, you can That's manage all your backups and your restores uh, directly from here. Yeah, it's the only time I've ever done a restore is for a, a developer. I've <laughs> <laughs> uh, never had a daily base failure. It's always been a code failure. But, and remember, Test your restores. Even even in Cassandra world, you need to know that your restores are working. You only get one point for a backup. You get 99 for a restore. So do that. Um, so how about security? Oh yeah, this is the, this is the one that I think a lot of people don't think exists in NoSQL. There's been some interesting blogs over the past few years how NoSQL and security are not friends. So I think that's an old notion, don't you? Definitely, right? I mean, we've got a number of clients that have uh, done PCI compliance on top of Cassandra app. So. Right, and the PCI compliance, of course, isn't isn't the database; it's the process. But then, of course, you've got to have a database that can support those processes. And 
things like auditing and whatnot. That, that's just really important. Security, is, and it's always advancing. I, I think that's something that um, you'll see a lot of changes in or increase, um, increase security through the years because it's just something that has to be transparent to the end user. Because let's face it, security is like the last thing you want to think about or the last thing anyone thinks about when they're building something. Um, you're checking boxes at the end, but you really should be, you know, have it integrated like that. Okay, so we're back to my, my duties here. So we, we checked off a few boxes here. That's cool. We got all that. What more do we need to look at? Um, now, this, this seems more in the line of, like, maybe a developer would want to do this or an architect, like designing a database, creating a database, uh, managing the objects. I mean, managing objects is a DBA role thing. Um, and even, like, looking at new features. So what do we got for that? Well, thank you for, for saying this, Patrick, but we've got this <laughs> new, lovely product called Dev Center. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I just moved you right into that, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> I really did. Yeah. In case I ever wanted a job introducing the prices right. Right. Uh, so you're from, um, familiar with being able to trace queries because, you know, there might be a performance problem somewhere to see what is going on um, inside the internals of how this, uh, this query is communicating with the different nodes. Uh, Dev Center will do that for you. Um, it will give you the ability to uh, write queries, uh, manage your uh, updates, your inserts, your create tables. And look, um, just take a quick look, for those who are not familiar already with Cassandra, um, how you actually interact with Cassandra. This, this looks vaguely familiar, doesn't it? And it's not quite SQL, but it's, it's called CQL, and it's designed specifically so people who know SQL can interact well with Cassandra, and this is Cassandra's native interface. And I will interject here. This is um, this is, will be we will go way in depth on this in our next webinar, um, and so this is just a preview of that. But um, this is yeah CQL and data modeling from a relational standpoint to this we will cover in another webinar, in the next webinar. Right. The next that's, one we also that's have. That's well worth it. Schema management here too. Yeah. So being able to create tables and you know primary keys. Again, um, very familiar to tools like Toad or. Um, no. Sorry. Sure. Okay. There you go. It's good. It's right. fine. I'm good. Okay. So the last thing was, of course, I, and I totally blew it, but the ETL situation that we last that we we landed on last time. Um, that to me was. I, I just don't like ETL at all because um, it's costly and it's not efficient and from a lot of reasons it can also lose data. It's just something that I, I'd rather not do. So what do we get with Cassandra in this case? Yeah, but, you know, I was able to bill at a 375 an hour for writing ETL jobs. Yeah, so. ETL jobs are, that was definitely a billable. <laughs> But this is this is the one thing about DataStack Enterprise, um, which is built on top of Apache Cassandra, uh -huh. that I think is just for me is 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 the is the killer app, right? Because you've got your OLTP data, you've got your transaction data in Cassandra, and it uses its native abilities to replicate to be able to replicate to virtual data centers. Again, they could be in the same rack, they could be in the same data center, or they could be someplace completely different. But so you have some workload isolation, so you can um, run search type queries with Solar integrated on top of Cassandra. Or you can do OLAP or streaming um, queries with Spark on top of Cassandra or Hadoop on top of Cassandra. Or Cassandra on top of Hadoop. I'm not sure which way that would go. But Yeah, well, with, with Hadoop, that is um, unfortunately a little less integrated, but I think it's, it's, it's fine for what it is. It's to bring your own Hadoop, um, where you can have your own Hadoop cluster. And we provide connectors so that it will um, grab data and um, it will pull and push data to a Hadoop cluster from a Cassandra cluster. So, but the idea here is that you don't have to ETL it. The data will be automatically replicated in real time to these clusters, so you can integrate search into your application. You can put a BI tool, a Tableau, or a anything out there with an ODBC or JDBC connection. Um, to allow your users to do ad hoc queries without interrupting your OLTP and your transaction processing. Right, and that so I and I think we've seen some really interesting applications. And this is what it comes down to: is 
So let's kind of wrap this up into a, a neat ball is, and let's take this back to the, the, the plateau that we're dealing with. Um, Cassandra in itself is a database that can do things that are going to respond to what we've created, right, which is mobile apps and IoT, web. Those are all creating a lot more demand and need scaling problems that we haven't yet seen. Well, we have now. We we're in it. But in addition to that, and this is where DataStack Enterprise helps out too, is you do need some extra goodies in there, like being able to do search on top of the same data, being able to analyze that data, really critical anymore because you, you, you're not just collecting data and storing it. you got to do something with it. And to make money with your application, and this is, this is, this is really the important takeaway, is that when you need to make money with your database, you use Cassandra. When you need to count money, you use Oracle. That's what it comes down to. And if you look at the users that are using Cassandra, they're making money. This is a part of their bottom line, and they are relying on Cassandra to make sure that it's up, online, ready to rock. When their users are ready with their wallets out, they're ready to go. And more importantly, I think it just gives everyone a better experience um, because, let's face it, slow is as good as down anymore. Um, I think that, and that's something we can all relate to, right? So, where are we at now? So is there a catch to any of this? <laughs> yeah, there's a little bit of a catch. Oh, there's a lot of catches right there. Um, yeah, there is a few. There's some good Google uh, image through right there. Um, so we, we've hopefully gone through and explained to you how some of the traditional methods in Oracle are done in Cassandra, how, they're, how you can be able to build a application that is always on, highly scalable with Cassandra. Now, but there, there is a catch. There are some things that you need to change about the way you think in order to take the most out of, get the most out of the system. And that is going to be the topic of our next two webinars. We're going to be, uh, next week's topic right. is going to be on data modeling. So how do you data model for Cassandra? And the following week, we're going to talk about how you change your development methodology. So how do you need to change your organization to or the way the organization works together in order to, uh, to take advantage of Cassandra and new, the new technologies to the best of your ability. Yeah, so I'm, I'm super excited about part two. Now, I've, I've been doing data modeling um, talks for <laughs> three or four years now, mm -hmm. actually four years, I checked. And the, um, the, the concept of data modeling from a relational to Cassandra um, is getting more bait, I think, and it's, uh, that's a word. And we, we, I think this is where we're going to probably, you're going to hear some of the, the same things again, but hopefully some new things, and we'll highlight some of the newer features that are in Cassandra 2.2 and probably what's coming in 3.0. But we, we need you to understand that this is not, this isn't going to kill you. Now, I, if, if there's one webinar, if you're going to, if you're going to watch one of these, watch that one or you already watched this one so too late but that number two is going to be really critical especially to, for developers because understanding your data model is the first thing you need to get whenever you build a successful application all right well then. we want to see you we want to see you up close personal and that's going to be the cassandra summit in 2015. Um, santa clara two days of fun and excitement we are also going to be doing a uh, certification with O'Reilly Media, so this is a big, big deal. So um, this is what's a certification test. We have uh, training. You can sign up for that. It is the, that is the pay-for part of this. Now, it is free to go to, and if you want to do a priority pass, which basically guarantees that you can get into certain sessions, because I'm going to tell you, there's going to be thousands of people here. It will be a big event. So getting that priority pass is pretty important if you want to guarantee spots because there's going to be some really hot talks and this will give you that, it gives you that guarantee. Um, so Rachel and I both have priority passes, so you can pick a winner there. It doesn't matter. You're the winner when you get 50% off, uh, but pick mine. And, and um, certification, get 25% off. You can pick Rachel for that one. But um, we, we really do want to see you. And register now. It is filling up fast. Um, get your hotel rooms. I mean, do all that now if you can because you don't want to wait. Um, last year, uh, we people waited to the last second, and it was really tough because there's a lot of people didn't get a go because it was just full. And 
Um, that we don't want to have that. We're also doing it online. A lot of it's going to be online. So if you if you can't make it for some reason, you won't miss out. And of course, all of the talks will be videoed, and we will have that all available on our YouTube channel as well. So um, if you can't make it, um, don't don't despair. You will eventually be able to see some of the talks, almost actually all of them. But really, the important thing is when you're there. You get to talk to people, and I think this is the most important thing. Talking to people, relating experiences, finding out how they're doing it is really something. So I think that is it. Uh oh, we're gonna have to um, we're gonna have to take some questions. I think here. Um, let's see who has the Q and A. That's the question. <laughs> First question I have. Yeah, right. I have the Q and A. I'm just. I'll ask some questions to you guys. Um, Devin, can you pick a few of those out for us, please? There's a good amount of these. So all the questions that we don't get to, we will try to throw a little blog together for everybody. Um, I did yeah, actually I saw a comment just recently that um, Exadata is shared nothing. And that is true. That is true. Um, although it is a, I have run Exadata in production and um, I should be very clear, yes. That is a shared nothing architecture. Although it is a very specific architecture, it's built. You buy a box and it's huge. Um, if you want to do multi-data center, then you, you have to use Golden Gate um, on that. But I, I will I will make that clarification. Yeah. Here's a question. Yeah. Will the nodes that have special applications, such as BI tools in the middle, still be treated as nodes that normally receive and store data? I'll take that one. Uh, every node, every node is the same. So, if you're if you're running in the multi data center with analytics and search, those nodes in that data center will all be the same. Where they're running Cassandra and whatever extra. So, like in search node, they would be running Solar on top of Cassandra, and in analytics, they'd be running Cassandra and Spark. But if you're running Cassandra only, then Cassandra, each Cassandra node is independent. They are um, there's no difference between those other than what they're primarily responsible for the data. But if you make a request to any node, that it will find your data. So it's not, there's no specific nodes that are, um, that are set aside for just queries. And these are, and I know that this is a very common pattern with a lot of databases. It's like, oh, these are the query nodes, these are the data nodes. There's none of that. There's no master slave architectures or anything like that. It's all peer to peer. So, um, the, the, the short answer is no, <laughs> but the long answer is why. All right, Devin, hit us with another one. Uh, here's a question. What are the biggest differences between Cassandra and Hadoop? Yeah, I can go ahead and take that. Um, so they're very, very different beasts. Hadoop is designed to do uh, collection. So take tons and tons and tons of machines, throw a ton and ton of, da of data at it, and you know, do some plotting through it with MapReduce in order to figure out answers to you know, deep questions. Uh, it is much more of an, OL, um, an OLAP or an OLAP system you know, designed to do data lakes and to basically process the data of the universe. That's what it was designed to do, was to, to hack through the internet. Cassandra, on the other hand, is an OLTP system. It is designed for high speed, reads and writes, little tiny bits of data, short requests, data coming in and out at all times. Um, they work on completely different file systems. They are completely separate projects. Uh, they run in conjunction with each other, so you can you know, take your Cassandra data and move it into Hadoop if you prefer to do your analytics on it. And, but you keep Cassandra for its um, uptime, for its scale, and for transaction processing. Right. Yeah, they are, they are not the same system. Not at all. All right, Devin, another one? Is Devin still there? Oh, yeah, I'm here. Sorry. All right, one, one more. One more question, and then we can, we can be done with this. Can you write, run Spark or Solar on different nodes from Cassandra nodes? Oh, I, I kind of answered that, but let me be very clear. So when you're running uh, DataStacks Enterprise, it will you can't run them um, non-separately. So 
whenever you run Cassandra only, that will be in one data center. When you run Spark and Cassandra together, they are in another data center, and Spark and Solar are in a different data center. Um, this is for workload isolation and also for, you know, just for task isolation. We want to make sure that um, these nodes are there for a specific reason. By using data center segregation, um, it gives you um, it gives you some options, and so that's why it's done that way. You know, Spark is going to use so much CPU, so much memory, et cetera. That is going to be a different type of node, potentially. So you want to make sure that those nodes are there. But remember, we keep taking advantage of here is the, the basic part of Cassandra, which is replication. It will replicate your data um, no matter what. And so that's what makes this work. We just take advantage of that basic fact. So um, I think that's it. Now, just uh, we will be collecting these questions as well. So if we didn't get your question, we're going to try to we'll try to follow up with a blog post to do the Q and A in there as well. So just keep your eye out for an email um, when this gets posted. We'll try to post a, a, the Q and A blog post as well, just so we make sure we get better coverage on your questions. I know you have a lot, and of course hit us up on Twitter. Um, I see a few people already have on my Twitter account right now. Great. Um, we love to hear from people. And if you see a Cassandra date coming to a town near you, our next one's next month in New York, um, just come on by. We have a lot to talk about there, and you can ask your questions there as well. Um, lots of experts. So thank you very much for spending an hour with us, and we will see you next time.